Hello, everybody, and welcome to All Queued Up, the review podcast tried to streaming services like Netflix, Amazon Prime, HBO Max, Disney Plus, etc., etc., etc. I'm your host, Greg Dietz. With me always is my co-host, Maya Don Fisher. How's your week been? Pretty fucking good. Uh, really good, actually. Saturday, uh, Misty and Madison and I went out. Uh and did some things uh took madison to the comic shop let her do some painting on a mini painting day i wasn't feeling the best and didn't paint anything i just bought something to paint later but i sat there and just gave her tips and tricks um taught her a few new techniques that she wasn't aware of in mini painting uh you know we stayed for a couple of hours talked to a couple of people and then we went and got some Chinese food, and uh, then we went grocery shopping. First time I've been grocery shopping since the pandemic started. <laughs> What'd you think? Is it still as awful as always? Dude, I, I, I was like a kid in a candy store. Ugh. Oh, no, no, I'm sorry. It was It was a delightful treat for me. Uh, even though it was only Walmart's grocery section, the fact the fact is, you know, I mean, as our listeners are, are aware, I'm an amputee and I don't have the ability to drive. Um, so we live a block and a half from the town grocery store. If we need something from the store, Misty goes and gets it. It's been so fucking long. Since I've been in the grocery store, I forgot shit that's out there. And I'll, I'll be scrolling through Pinterest, looking at recipe ideas, be like, ooh, this sounds good to make, honey. Will you go get the stuff to make this? You know, because I don't know what's on hand over there anymore. And it's a small town. Uh, it's the only major grocery store in the entire fucking county. A town of 1,400, a county of about 12,000, one grocery store. So, they're out of shit a lot of times. I hate grocery shopping. Dude, I... I fucking hate grocery uh, shopping. We got into Walmart, and I was just like, oh, boy. Uh, you know, and it, uh, I'm sure that's pathetic sounding and sad to some people. But... I, no, I mean, it makes sense to the context that... You know, it's it's one of those you don't really know how it is unless you experience it to the extent of I've been doing the grocery shopping for my parents the entire pandemic. I'm the only one that has gone into the grocery store. And yeah. now it's just at the point where without the car, it's become a, a more of a convenience that I'm the only one that goes into the grocery store. So because of that, that um uh The, the issue in this say I don't know what it's like to not have been able to go to the grocery store in so fucking long because I'm just doing it. And I, I hate yeah. going to the grocery store because I just people drive me fucking nuts. So there's that, but um no, it makes sense to what you're saying. Like if you have a done something that you used to do all the time for a very long time you're suddenly going to look at it as a bit like of you, an over you're, you're breaking up on it's me. A, it's a dreaded chore oh sorry i said it's a dreaded chore for me boy i fucking get you, I get you. To fix their shit i'm telling you man it's 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 getting bad. So I understand what adding you're features. From, just... Yeah, StreamYard keeps adding features. And I think, you know, that it's hindering something. I don't know. I'm, I'm, uh, we'll, we'll discuss that off air. But anyway, yeah. So had a, had a good time, you know, bought myself a Lent. Uh, 70% cocoa chocolate bar. Haven't had one of those in about four fucking years. And savored it. 
ate a couple parts of it Saturday, a couple Sunday, a couple yesterday, finished the last of it last night. Uh, it was delicious. You know what I'm talking about? Uh-huh. They're like, oh yeah. oh yeah, they're so fucking good. Because I love dark chocolate. I'm not a big milk chocolate fan. I'm a big dark chocolate fan. So, yeah, that was that was delicious. Saw those Doritos queso chips and tried those. Those were fucking fantastic. Not Doritos, but um, Ruffles queso. I'm, I'm going to get me a uh, thing of those today. I'm, I'm telling you, shopping. they were quite flavorful, quite powerful, very, very tasty. And I'm not a, not a big potato chip person, but these were some of the best potato chips I'd ever tried. I'm willing to give a shot. They're new, so I always I always get new chips. To try them out. Yeah, yeah, I recommend them. Uh, let's see uh, what else happened this week. Uh, started uh, replaying the Legend of Dragoon. It was released on PlayStation Plus Premium uh, the other day, and that's a game that I absolutely adored from way back in the ps1 days i mean it was literally released in the you know december 30th of 1999 so it came out in the year basically 2000 right in the year it's 20 <laughs> it's a 23 year old game that i only played through once and i remember it being very fun and it is it's still very fun but it's very dated compared to today's games the dialogue, the complexity, the translation, the localization of this game is god awful. <laughs> it is bad, and I'm like, oh, this game, it's so beloved by so many. It's it, it needs a modern day remake, or you know, or a sequel. You know, it's just something. It was because the premise there behind the game, it was just way too fun but yeah i'm having fun doing that and then you know last week when we recorded i told you i ran out of paint and i had to order paint so i was wise enough to order two cans of paint because these are small small spray cans they are 100 milliliters of paint in a can that's only three ounces um and it's a good thing i ordered two cans because i went through a whole can yesterday Jesus. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was telling but you this, white's, like I have... white's hard to paint, man. It's taking two two coats on these parts. But go ahead, you were saying. I was just telling you that I have a hard time doing those miniatures because if it's a minute task, my brain just goes, nope, nope. Everything everything sweats. I su- like everything sucks right now. Like it's just it's bad. It's so calming for me. It is literally like it's literally like my happy place when I'm when I'm when I'm creating something or painting something, building something. It's uh, it's fucking so zen. Like yesterday, I started painting at eight o'clock in the morning, and I painted. You know, and it's like I'll do uh, I'll prime it, let the prime sit for about thirty minutes because it's fast drying primer. Then I'll do a layer of paint. Then I'll let it sit for 30 minutes because it's fast drying paint. Then I'll do another layer of paint. Uh, you know, build that section after the paint's cured enough to where you can handle it and it won't smudge or fuck it up. And then start on the next part, right? I worked eight and a half hours yesterday and it only felt like I'd been doing two hours worth of work. You know, it's just like... Holy shit, and I got a lot done. Uh, all I have left to do now is the backpack. And my panel line marker, when I was working on it yesterday, ran out. And I was like, oh, fuck. Well, I was fortunate enough that I found, right before we started recording, two panel line markers. So I'll, have, I'll be able to finish the painting it today, panel lining it today possibly top coating it i might be able to have this thing done completely this evening so i'm excited about that because i'm entering it into a painting competition of course 
Um, but yeah, I'm looking forward to having a lot of fun building this kit. It's beautiful. For anybody curious as to what I'm building, I'm building a Gundam Barbatos Master Grade Kit uh, from the series Iron Blooded Orphans. Uh, and if that's, you're like, what's that? You can go on my Instagram and look. Also, Facebook. Sounds like you could also just watch the anime too, but. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, that's that's pretty much been my week, you know, pretty good week all around. Oh, no, I forgot. Greg messages me Sunday morning. Was it Sunday morning or Monday morning? Uh, I don't know what you're going to say. Might have been Monday. Might have been Monday morning. Uh, <laughs> you asked me, what's the best way to send me money? And oh, I like, yeah. <laughs> uh, I was like, well, I have PayPal. I have Venmo. I have, you know, Cash App. You know, just the next thing I know, you PayPal me some money. And you sent me a screenshot. The Last of Us Part Two was on sale in the PlayStation Store for nine dollars and seventy nine cents, and you sent the money for it. So Greg bought me The Last of Us Two, and I, I was like, "Oh, fucking a, thank you." So yeah, that was that was also a pleasant for, surprise. For and I'm going, I'm, I'm, I'm going to, I'm 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 going to I'm going to get to it soon. <clears throat> But yeah, well, I figured you weren't going to start it anyway until you finished uh, painting your Gundam. So yeah, I'm sure you yeah, because that's to do it. that's been my focus. You know that thing, that kit's. I put a lot of hours into that kit. I mean, there's hundreds of parts, and every Ooh. single part is painted, primed, and painted, uh, and. All the white parts have two thin coats of paint. Um, it's well, just to just to give you an idea, the head of that thing alone, you know, just looks like a head, right? Well, it's it's either fourteen or sixteen different pieces to form the head. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's 14 because there were eight pieces to actually construct the armored or the the frame part of the head with the eyes and the everything. And then with the armor pieces, that was another six pieces to armor it up. So, yeah, 14 pieces, just the head alone. Each arm was 38 pieces, and that's not including the armor parts over each one. <laughs> Damn. Yeah, yeah. So there's a lot of pieces involved, a lot of painting, a lot of building, but yeah, I fucking love it. Uh, but yeah, that's that's been my week. Really good week. How's your How's your week been? Uh, mostly work. If I'm being honest, it was. Uh, my boss went on another fucking trip, and he's about to go on another one in the beginning of March. That's Which I, I'm, I'm honestly okay with. This guy fucking irritates the shit out of me. Like I know everyone's like, "Oh, my boss sucks," but like, my boss really fucking sucks. Like he is just an obnoxious fucking old man who has lost touch with any kind of reality outside of that fucking job. Um, like this man cannot go on vacation without coming back and bitching about going on vacation. When he was on Dude. that cruise, like. Why but go then, if you're just going to complain about it? Because that's who he is as a person. That's what I'm getting at, is that he... He bitches because he doesn't really know what else to do in the scenario. He doesn't like doing these things that his wife wants to do, that his family wants to do with him. But he does them because he loves them, which is great and all. But that means he comes back to work and complains to me about the entire thing. Like, I even asked him after the cruise, I was like, well, did anything? Because he was like, my wife and I got sick, so we had to spend three days in the fucking room. And I went, well, you were there for, for, for seven, so what else did you do? And he was like, and then he started telling me about all this good stuff, but then he was bitching about it at the same time. And I'm just like, man, like, it's just, it's more annoying than it is anything, because I'm like, 
I'm the one that has to hear it. I'm the one that has to go through it and and deal with like him bitching because he's my boss. Um, but like this last week was I particularly fucking bad. Uh, so I'm gonna try to make this as short as I can. But one of the problems that Steve has is that he 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 he, he micromanages way the fuck too much, and he doesn't know how to not micromanage. Um, I've been doing the job for seven months now, which when you think of it from that perspective, like good lord. But I know how to manage the storage stuff. I know how to manage the U-Haul stuff. I don't need him over my fucking shoulder. This woman calls and she wants to come in. Like, this was Sunday night. So she wants to come in Monday and um, uh, get her storage unit situation figured out. And she asks, uh, you know, she asks if she can come in. And so I'm looking at her storage unit stuff. And what it was was like she called on, she called in January to pay December's bill and wanted to come in and put a new card on. So that way she could pay January, or sorry, February before March came out on the 5th. That makes sense? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, and I'm looking at her thing while I'm talking to her, trying to figure out exactly what she needs and wants. And Steve is literally over my shoulder trying to ask me, well, not even asking me, he's, he, he assumes what this customer wants. He assumes what the situation is. So he's, he's over my shoulder and he goes, what you got to do, Greg, is to go here and then you're going to go here and I'm following his directions. And I go, literally went to a screen that made no fucking sense to what was happening. I go, what are you doing? And he goes, well, if, if, if he's trying to ask about this and that and this, then and I went, she is asking this. And he goes, oh, well, why didn't you tell me? The fuck did I have an opportunity to do so, Steve? So, um, uh, I'm helping the customer continue about the, her situation. And I, and I got to change her, her card now. Now, look, you rent something. And you don't change, like you don't call the, the the company that you're renting the thing from, and update your card information or update your your phone number or your address or whatever. Like that's on you. You're kind of done mm -hmm. not doing that. Yeah. So I'll, I'll I'll give him that, but that's what she was doing. She wanted to update her her phone number. She wanted to update her credit card, but she wanted she had more information. She wanted to get to her storage unit, so she's like, I'm going to come in, and I'm like, Great, come on in. Um afterwards after i hang up with her he's kind of giving me this look like i don't understand why you're irritated with me and he goes let me let me show you something here greg and i went i went are you going to show me how to go to her full history to see every payment she's ever had steve and every time it declined to what extent why are we doing that and i said it just like that too and he goes he gives me this look like where is this voice coming from because now i'm irritated right <laughs> and I went and I said, I said, why does any of that matter to the context of what happened, Steve? And he goes, Well, if you're trying to help the customer, you need to see their history. And I went, I did that. I literally went and looked at her history before even starting this entire situation. And he goes, Oh, you know how to look up a customer's history? And I went, Yeah, because it says full history. There's a button that says full history you know i'm not saying that i'm the smartest person but my reading comprehension is pretty good and he goes well look at this and so he pulls it up anyway and he goes see the last time she paid and i interrupted him and i go the last time she paid steve was in fucking january when she called linda and he goes he looks at it he goes yeah okay and i went like i said i went there and, like, that's the kind of shit I have to deal with with him. Like, a customer will come in, they'll rent a truck, there'll be a small issue. Whether they didn't put the gas back and they got irritated and I had to talk to them. I won't fucking tell him that happened. Because the second that I do, he'll go into the customer's full fucking history through the website and start trying to snoop and nose, nose around to what the fuck happened. And at the end of the fucking the entire conversation with something like this, none of it mattered. Nothing was changed. Nothing was updated. Nothing, nothing. It didn't matter. 
But this is how he looks at the job. This is how he looks at the world. And I have to deal with it on a weekly fucking basis. Ugh. So when he says, I'm going on another trip and you're going to be here alone. It's exciting to hear those words. No, I get you. I get you. But man, it just, it gets so fucking exhausting having to deal with him. Like, I, I think I said this a while back to you, like the job isn't difficult. He's difficult. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I've had employers like that. I'm sure. Yeah, I'm. Sh- I'm sure everyone has. It's just they like, want to micromanage every facet of everything. Every it's like it's, it's like you hired me to do the job. You hired your crew here to do the job. Let us do the fucking job. You don't have to be here twenty four seven, hovering over us. And you know, it's just it was it got unbearable. It still is unbearable. I mean, I'm not going to lie. Like, there's my Uber driver uh, uh, on Sunday. Um, you know, I get in the car and I'm just talking about the job. And he's like, what do you do? And I, they start telling him. I was like, yeah, but it's, you know, the job The job is 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 not, it's, it's easy. It's my boss. It's a pain in the ass. And I started telling him. And he was like, wait, so your boss drinks at the end of the day? And I said, yeah, he, the more he drinks, the more, like, obnoxious he gets about things and starts you know bitching about certain things and he goes no that's not cool man that's not cool like he shouldn't be doing that and i'm like i agree (laughs) i wholeheartedly agree with you and he goes uh do you smoke weed and i was like i do and he goes okay so my brother he works at a convalescent hospital it's like really close to where you live um and i knew exactly which one he was talking about because it's the only one like even in a certain radius from my house he works there as as a chef. Like he just makes food for all the old people there, and uh, he's been like trying to find a sous chef, but like nobody can stay on, and it doesn't require like a degree or anything like that. You just have to show up to work and prep food. Oh, huh. and so I'm kind of thinking about it. The the the, the issue with King for this this U-Haul is not difficult. It's a, it's actually yeah. a pretty easy fucking job. Um, yeah, but it's like, am I willing to deal with how easy it is on top of Steve? Am I willing to put put up with that in order to keep the easy job? Yeah, yeah. Which you know, a sous chef job, any food service job, is not an easy job. It's physically no. demanding, uh, as you and I are both well aware. Yeah. So it's like it's it, I'm I'm doing this debate in my head of like and and the the job itself like the hours wouldn't be much different than this so it's like what do I do? Well there's a lot of that you know. right now. Plus plus there's the whole aspect of like it's getting closer and closer to when ooh, the move to Texas happens. Ugh. Oh that's I'm still hoping fucking... I'm 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 still hoping that there's something that happens and you guys don't move. <laughs> That's gonna it, no, it, there's the only way that I can think of us not moving is like I find a job that pay like that I'm getting like eighty thousand a year with. But if that was even the case, I would just move us into a better fucking apartment. Yeah, because you have to keep in mind. There's a couple aspects as to why this move is happening. Like it was hap- it was already in motion years ago. Like shortly after Jeff got divorced, that's when it was happening. Um, but the difference oh, okay. was that Jeff was going to find a house in El- in California. We were going to move to Tracy, which is about an hour from where we are now. Yeah. Over over a year, Jeff just you know became more and more Republican, and he was like, he. So we all know that Jeff is in the Brodos. Thank God he doesn't listen to this podcast. Um, would you like to hear what he did the other day that was real stupid? Uh, obviously, I love hearing <laughs> I, I love hearing dumb things that Jeff has said or done stories. So I'm upstairs. I'm playing video games with Andy. Um, some Overwatch, I believe, and. 
Jeff tries to call me twice. I can't answer. It Andy. It was Andy and his son Zach. And Jeff tries to call me twice. I ignore them because I'm in the middle of the match. I can't really answer my phone. And I'm suddenly thinking, like, both my parents are awake. Why is he calling me? So I ignore it. A couple minutes go by. All of a sudden, my mom's knocking on my door. And I should clarify, she's beating on my door. Like, it's fucking urgent. And I'm like, oh, God, it's a goddamn emergency. She comes in. She goes, Jeff needs your social security number now. And I went, for what? And she goes, I'll explain later. And I went, okay. And she goes, I just need the last four digits. Odd. Like, why wouldn't you need the whole thing? Okay, here they are. Thinking, if you don't have the first five, you're not going to do much with the last four. And and it was no extra information. It was just that. And I'm like, this is fucking weird. Yeah, yeah. So I tell my mom, and she goes, "Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll like, I'll talk to you later." Okay. I go to like we finish because Andy and Zach had to go, and I go downstairs, and I'm and they're still on the phone with Jeff, and I go, "What's going on?" Mom says, "So Jeff and Dad have been talking about getting solar panels for the house because of the." type of electricity bills you have to deal with in Texas. So I was like, okay, yeah, that makes sense. And she goes, well, Jeff happened to be home and some door-to-door salesman came there with information about solar panels. Immediately red, like red flags just going off in my head. Yeah. That's a big red flag. But I'm like, okay, well I go, did Jeff give them my social security number? And she goes, just the last four digits. Like, well, that's better than fucking the whole thing, I guess. Um, so the guys were still at Jeff's house and they're talking to Jeff and yada, yada. And I go, okay, whatever, whatever, you know, that's not much that can be done. I don't think much of it. I move on and I let it go and I get things done. There's a bunch of shit I had to get done. So I just get until there was daughter salesman at his house dad goes i don't know but they came to his door and i was like okay something about this isn't sitting right go through my day on on uh monday the rest of the day no big issue tuesday morning I get up, take a shower, like I normally do. I get out of the shower, and I see that Jeff has tried to call me three times. I was like, what the fuck? I get out of the bathroom. I'm like, I'm going to call him back. Dad is on the phone with him. I can hear I can hear Jeff talking to Dad on the phone. So I eavesdrop at the top of the stairs a little bit, and I'm like, what are they talking about? And I can hear that Jeff is pissed, but I can't quite make it out. So I go downstairs. And I'm ready to make some breakfast. And that's when I hear the rest of the information. The guys that came to Jeff's store were frauds. Oh, of course they were. So Jeff had to do his due diligence to make sure that they didn't do anything with his information, that they didn't do anything with my information. And, uh, Jeff was pissed. And I'm like, I hope you're mad at yourself. Uh, yeah, exactly. Because he's got no right to be angry at anybody but himself. And uh, I talked to dad and I go, when that was happening, not one time did you think, oh, this seems fraudulent. This seems fake. No, everything seemed on the up and up. It did, huh? That's odd. And he goes, why do you say that? And I go, a couple door-to-door salesmen came to Jeff's, half con- to Jeff's house conveniently ready to sell solar panels. And neither of you went, mm, I don't know about this. Neither of you went, let me Google the company to see if they're on Better Business Bureau. Neither of you said, hey, let's, let's just Google the company and see their rating. You guys didn't do that. You just accepted this gift from the universe 
and said, here's my info. Oh, I didn't think of from that perspective. And I'm moving in with you guys. Oh, my God. <clears throat> so, yeah. Yeah. Could not fucking believe it. And I was like, this is unfucking real, dude. And so, like, that stress on top of the job. Like, shit gets fucking exhausting so quick, man. So fucking quick. But, uh... Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what else to say to that. Like, that's... You hear that story, and you're sitting there thinking, like, is Greg overreacting a little bit? And I'm like, am I? Like... And I, I'm not too concerned because not enough of my information was given to those assholes, right? It was yeah. literally the last form of social social security number, and you can't do a whole lot with that. No, it, mainly that comes up when you're trying to verify personal information to get into accounts of some sort. Uh, but if they don't have like your banking information. And the, and you don't have a credit card. Nope. Uh, you're, there's not much that you would have to worry about to, that I'm aware of. So. Well, it was really funny because Jeff was like, Greg, your credit is fucking amazing. And I'm like, I, I'm aware that my credit score is amazing. Like, I'm glad it's over 700. I understand that. I probably have the better credit score out of this entire fucking like the four of us. He was like, yeah. dude, it's great. And I go, the, the problem is, isn't my, like, isn't that the problem is that my credit score is brand spanking fucking new. Yeah. That's what the red flag set off. Like it's not my fucking score being low or whatever. They go, Oh, he doesn't really have a history. So no, And I just have to live with that. I just have to sit on it. That doesn't make any sense. I'm sure it doesn't. But, uh, but yeah, so that's that. Anyway, um, well, we're here to review some things, right? That's what we do usually. Let, let, yeah, let's do that. Um, so we're going to review three things. If you remember from last week, we're reviewing, um, I have it right here. Hold on, let me pull it up. So episode seven of The Last of Us, episode eight of Poker Face, and the brand new episode of season three of The Mandalorian. Um, and I just threw away my list because I'm an idiot. Uh, but, no, I don't need that one up. Jesus Christ. There we go. Uh, but we're going to start with the most recent, not most recent, I'm sorry, the earliest that we watched in the week, which is... Poker face. Poker face. Yeah, this uh, this episode was titled "The Orpheus Syndrome," and this episode in particular was actually directed by Natasha Leone herself. Um, oh, but yeah, I this one, see that? It's, it's... Yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't know if it was her directorial debut in anything. I don't know if she's directed other things in the past. I'll have oh, to look God, that up. But she's directed. She's a hundred. Oh, ah, she's a hundred percent directed other things, but I'm gonna double check that. So, but go ahead. Okay. Uh, well, this one is set in the state of New York, so she's made her way pretty far east, and she uh, it, it opens up with two movie industry veterans arguing, uh, culminating with uh, the male subject Max jumping off of a balcony to his death. Uh, a week later. Yes. Sorry, I was looking at her uh, directorial stuff, and she did an episode of Orange is the New Black, specifically season seven, episode nine, The Heidi Hole. Oh. Um, oh. She directed the movie. She directed the uh, Hulu original series based on, like, same name, but High Fidelity. She directed an episode of that. Do you remember that thing we watched called Sarah Cooper, Everything's Fine on Netflix? Maybe we didn't watch it together, but it was like a 45-minute comedy regarding everything going on in 2020. I didn't watch that, but yeah. It's terrible. It's fucking terrible, but she directed that. 
Uh, she directed four episodes of Russian Doll, uh, one okay. episode early in season one and three in season two, which we haven't watched season two, and then this. So, okay, that's okay. All. So a few things. So a few things. Yeah. So a week later, uh, the female involved in this altercation, Laura, visits a mutual friend, Arthur, played by Nick Nolte, who was. Uh, he was playing a reclusive, a reclusive visual effects artist and co-founder of the company LAM, which stands for Lights in Motion. Uh, you know, they're not getting too super creative with the naming of this stuff, you know. You don't have to. Yeah, yeah. It's, but, you know, it's, it's similar to ILM or, yeah. you know. Anyway, uh, she claims that the dispute with Max was about their impending divorce. And she feels guilty. She asks Arthur to recreate his likeness for therapeutic reasons. Uh, and he makes this beautiful maquette uh, bust of Max. Very lifelike. Incredible uh, how well it was done. Uh, before you continue, um, did you recognize the actor who played Max? Uh, Tim Russ. Do you know who that, like, what, a character that he played that I immediately was like, oh, that's cool. Not familiar with him, no. Uh, oh, you don't watch Star Trek. That's why. Um, do you remember the show Voyager? Oh, was he like one of the main characters on there? Somewhat, yeah. I mean, he was—he played, um, I believe, it wasn't a science officer, but it, it was science officer, but he was a Vulcan. Okay, I know exactly who you're talking about now. I've seen images of this guy. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Fuck. I'm, I'm while you're talking about, it, I'm going to search that up because that's going to drive me nuts. Okay. Well, it turns out that the reason that she wanted this uncannily realistic bust of Max was for facial recognition to unlock his laptop to get in to delete files of a particular movie. Now, in the meantime, we see Charlie. She is uh, working in a barbershop, sweeping up hair and doing deliveries. And she has to deliver a bag of hair to Nick Nolte. And she's like, yeah, I got your bag of hair here. Uh, kind of weird. And then she discovers uh, that he is a special effects artist. And he, they hit it off on a day of drinking. And he invites her to be his new assistant, which she accepts. Uh, so she's also uh, delivering the bust later on. So she's familiar with the layout and uh of uh laura's property uh which comes into play later on you know and it, this one deals with a couple of murders and actually three murders spanning over 40 fuck or you know over 30 or 40 years uh because that was what the files involved uh, actual footage of Laura sabotaging a safety protocol that would allow for an actress to be pulled to safety from a water tank in a movie that they were filming that uh, Arthur was directing and that he had blamed himself for years. <coughs> yeah. Um, by the way, I just looked it up and... Uh... Pardon me. Okay, I just looked it up, and Tuvok's character, who played who Tim Russ played in Voyager, which is the fourth Star Trek series, um, he played the second officer, or the the position that Tuvok had was second officer, which is basically third in command. So it's captain, first officer, second officer. Yeah, that was his position. But his character was uh, used to be a a uh, Federation spy before he got commissioned to the Voyager. Oh, okay. Well, that's so, cool. But yeah, so uh, Louis Guzman's in this episode. Uh, yeah, he works as you know, kind of like the archivist at the at the company LAM, and he brings you know 
the specific reels of film for Arthur to view. Uh, you know, there's a lot that goes on in this episode. No, it was fantastic. It was it was really cool. Like I think I texted you. I was like, um, I said that uh, having Nick Nolte and Luis Guzman in the same episode is a fucking treat. Because it was, <laughs> it was a treat. Yeah, yeah. You know, really well done. Uh, I think this was uh, one of the better episodes by far. Yeah, I really uh, enjoyed it. And just her directorial style, you know, it came through. She did some unique things, uh, which was cool, especially at the end with the intercutting of making it look like vintage movie footage. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, it definitely had that vibe to it. Like she did her, they did their research into that style of filmmaking from back in the day where it was, it had to be practical and, and how certain scenes were shot in, in, in conjunction to what needed to be shown, especially in like older horror style movies. Yeah. Um, so that stuff was like, it was really fun to see, but yeah, they did, they did their due diligence when it came to that sort of angle. And as a, old school film fan that was i appreciate that shit you know not just half-assing it and and hoping for the best they they did the damn thing so no complaints on my end yeah, yeah. Per se. well let's you know not spoil anything else or there's really not much i mean we could talk about it for a while there's a lot we could say about it but you know what grade would you give it to encourage people who haven't seen it to go and watch it? Uh, this episode was the best in a hot second, so I'm going to give it an A. Maybe in you know, it's it's not it's not the most perfect episode. There's a few things in it like, like I love Nick Nolte, but he is definitely showing his age and wear and tear. Um, oh yeah, and uh, I think that the actress who plays the uh, what the fuck's her name, the actress's name, Laura. Uh, Cherry Jones. Yeah, Cherry Jones is definitely what I like to call an over-actor. And for the context of the episode, it makes sense to have somebody who's an over-actor for that specific scene. Um, but at the end of the day, like, you don't need an over-actor. But she is 100% an over-actor. Yeah, yeah. So... So it doesn't get an A plus in that because of that, but it is a, it's, it's a solid fucking episode. So, yeah. What yeah. what what are you? Uh, I, I echo that uh, absolutely in a uh, best episode we've had in several weeks, um, and we got to see more of her, uh, more of Charlie's humor in this one, and you know just kind of seeing her a little bit more relaxed as well. Uh, and, and genuinely enjoying herself uh, up until she's not anymore. <laughs> but uh, the whole uh, yeah. walking around with the horse head thing was fucking funny. Uh, yeah. But yeah, yeah. This, this is a this is a well done episode. I'm really enjoying this show. So we've got. I'm glad I suggested it. I'm glad. I'm glad I talked you into it. Yeah, yeah, we just got a couple episodes left of it, I believe. And uh, um, let's see, this two, is, I, think. I think it's ten total. So let me double check. Yeah, yeah, I think this was episode eight. Uh, we got nine and ten left, which is crazy because then, the, yeah, because I think this show has its finale the same week that Last of Us has its finale. Yeah. No. Oh, never mind. I'm fucking. I'm dumb. Jesus. Christ. I was looking at something else. It's okay. Don't you do that. Uh, no. Yeah, 10 total, 10 total. And Ryan Johnson is directing the last episode. He's cool. he, he wrote next week's and he's directed the last episode. Oh, that's cool. I, You know what? Scratch that. Reverse it. He's directing next week's and wrote the last one. Yes. Okay. 
All I know is Clea Duvall is going to be in one of the episodes, and I'm excited for that. Not exactly sure who that is. Well, um, but I'll I'll, I'll go look. It's not a big deal. Uh, well, yeah. So let's go ahead and talk about Last of Us. Speaking of, well, this was uh, <clears throat> sorry, I had to clear my throat a little bit. I apologize for audio listeners. Okay, um, all right. Our headphone listeners specifically. <laughs> um, this episode is called Left Behind, which is coincidentally the name of, or not coincidentally, but by design, the name of the downloadable content or DLC for the Last of Us video game, uh, which is a story that is set as a prequel of sorts to the main series, to the main uh, storyline. Uh, which it's intercut. We see uh, the last uh, episode six, we saw Joel was impaled in the stomach with an object and he was bleeding badly. And Ellie was, you know, distraught because she didn't know what to do for him and she's panicking. And this episode opens up. She's found them shelter. He's lying on a bed she's trying to help him and he is telling her to leave. Uh, mm -hmm. Essentially, you know, trying to just, you know, let him, let him die. And it shows she starts to enter another room and then we go to a flashback. And the flashback is her days at the Fedra uh, military school that she was uh, a, a part of. And we see her, you know, basically getting bullied and then standing up for herself and then giving choice, uh, given a choice of her future by her commanding officer. Uh, I don't know if he was like the headmaster or whoever he was, but <clears throat> he's like, you know, you can make something of yourself or you cannot. So. You know, she's kind of buying into the Fedra propaganda. Yeah. Well, you see that in uh, in the middle of the night, her former roommate and best friend sneaks back in. She had been missing for three weeks. And this is Riley. Riley's like, come with me. And she's like, where the fuck have you been? I thought you were dead. dead. And... Uh, she finds out she's joined the Fireflies, to which Ellie is extremely upset. She's like, they kill soldiers and, you know, hurt innocent people. Uh, now, I know this is a departure from the DLC, because in the DLC, Ellie was more like, oh, congrats. You know, good for you. This created kind of a rift between them which I think added some complexity to their relationship. But we see Riley take Ellie, uh, sneak, sneaks out, and takes her to a shopping mall. And it turns out that this shopping mall is secretly wired to the grid, uh, un unbeknowingly uh, to Fedra. And because there are no windows they've got free reign of this place and Ellie seeing all these wonders of a shopping mall from, you know, the late nineties, early two thousands. Uh, she sees an escalator for the first time and has a blast on it, you know, rides a carousel and they do the photo booth thing. They take her to an art rally, takes her to an arcade and, they're just having the time of their fucking life all while having these discussions, these layered discussions on why are you joining the Fireflies? Fedra's not so bad. They kind of hold everything together. And, you know, it's, it's definitely creating a strain, but 
in the end, we see how Ellie gets bit. And she gets bit by protecting uh, Riley, who was also trying to protect her and gets knocked down. But that little bit, her reaction, that visceral reaction to her discovering that she had been bitten, was even though we know she's immune at this point, she didn't know she was immune at that point. So that reaction was just wow. That was some that was some great acting by Bella Ramsey. Mm-hmm. Oh, uh, the the girl that played fucking uh, Riley too, like well fucking done. Yeah, yeah. Uh, shit. What was her name? I want to say. Uh. I looked it up last week because I wanted to know what else she was in. Something Storm is her last name. Kayla Storm, maybe? Not Kayla. No, that doesn't. That's not. Well, I got. I got IMDb here. Give me two seconds. Um, I just want to point out that a lot of stuff that was in this episode um, was pulled like Storm Reed. Storm Reed. Storm Reed. That's what it is. Um, yeah, a lot of the stuff from this episode was pulled right from the fucking DLC. I know that you haven't played it, so I won't tell you exactly. Well, that, stuff, but like, I, I've shot for seen shot, it's fucking same. Yeah, I had seen a lot of things about the DLC over the years, so that's why I've never made it a priority to play it. Which I know in the DLC, you well, know, you there. It, are, so. Yeah, I have it. I just haven't played it yet. But, uh, but well, that's the other thing that I want I want to point out about this small episode slash DLC is that, like I said last week, when the DLC came out, it came out about six months after the game had come out, and it was a cool like little add on. But but the thing that people don't didn't pick up on is why it took place, like why it shows Joel getting injured first before you even play the DLC. And Neil Druckmann said like shortly thereafter, like. The, it's important to tell this part of Riley, or not Riley, wow, of, of um, Ellie's uh, story. Uh, Ellie's story because it shows why she was so protective of Joel, why keeping him alive was so important to her. So I want people who watch this episode to understand that, like, when you're talking about a narrative structurally, this is this is it. This is exactly what needs to be discussed. Um you can't tell a story without having those types of stakes and you can't tell a story without explaining a person's motive through other story. So having this be where it is structurally is fucking perfect. And I love it so much for it being that Um, I I want Oh, you're cutting out on me. Oh, Neil Druckmann. I'll give it I'll give it a second. Okay, what was that about Neil Druckmann? We good? Yeah, yeah. What was that about Neil Druckmann? I didn't say his name correctly at first. Uh he um he understands the flow of a story he understands the reason you go a certain direction with characters and he's shown that with his work on like so he was not a narrative he did not write directly he worked with a team he worked on uncharted one two and three which are great games but the best game mm-hmm. of the uncharted series is four. Oh fuck I, yes i will i will die on that fucking hill and the and he wrote that entire game he wrote all yeah. of last of us and last of us part two the dude knows how to write a fucking story yeah he does like, and i agree wholeheartedly that uncharted 4 is the best in the series it just is i mean one of the things i've said time and time and time again is that when you tell a story you have to tell a human story and within that human story you may have a, a, a world that the characters live in I don't care what world you choose for your characters to live in. 
if you're telling the story of 18 fucking characters, your story is probably going to suck or not be as impactful. But if you're telling the story of a tight group of people, in this case, two, it's two people's story. You can have other characters come in that have a backstory, that have characteristics and whatnot, and that's great. But you need to have your story tight. Mm -hmm. And that's what makes a story work. You know, think to the most popular franchises. Star Wars works because there are three characters. You know, you you go to like... Oh, man, I'm trying to think of some, like, big fucking franchises that that work so well because it well, centralizes. Well, James Bond it focuses on him and whoever his, like, you know, assistant or, you know, is who whoever helps him in that particular movie. Uh those those are pretty uh you know i hate to use this as an example but the harry potter movies you know mm -hmm. the trio mm -hmm. ron harry and hermione right uh you know uh what else you know comes i mean any 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 of the marvel movies like you you live in a universe where superheroes and powers and magic exists right but in order to get to the big event in order to get to you finish end game to get to your next avengers movie you have to take why when we get you know quantum mania it's a big story but it's a story of scott and his daughter yeah. it's a story of hank and his wife you know it's it's a tight-knit family story granted there are five characters in that movie that you pay attention to kang is not a primary focus he is a villain from a distance there's a history there sure tell that history but that's not what made that movie so much fun to watch what made it fun was you had this tight-knit family and they were the focus um but you go to any marvel movie in that regard think of the worst ones the reason eternals doesn't feel as right as the other movies it's a good movie but it's not great it's because how many fucking characters in that goddamn movie? Yeah, yeah. That's too many. You can get to your big event, but you have to tell each character's thing separately. And that's kind of my point about what makes The Last of Us so good. That's my point about why The Walking Dead started to suck. Yeah. It needed to be about Rick. And it stopped being about Rick. It became more about Carol and Daryl. Came, it became more about every fucking character. Like, well, yeah, it, it just that's what that's what made it fucking fall off. And you know, I I just I look on my shelves and I see all the fucking cool shit that I have, and like I have little statues of side characters. But what makes a lot of these stories work? Take, okay, I'm going to give you an example. So the franchise Bioshock, right? You have this, whether it's Bioshock or Bioshock Infinite, you have this world that has been fleshed out and exists. But you have one character, or you have two characters, technically. Sorry, you have two characters. And it's about those two characters. And you have to have it work about those two characters. Otherwise, the story just falls off. And I think a writer, whoever's making a story has to realize this like if you make a world that exists and you want to tell multiple stories within that world fine like uh, game of thrones let me go to game of thrones there's a fuck ton of characters in that franchise right yeah yeah when he, when george martin tells the story in the books the focus is the starks period end of story mm. the focus is that family each chapter you read is from either um sansa john uh the crippled one the fuck's his name bran bran and um 
Maisley Williams. Aria. Aria. It's those four. Period. It doesn't go to Ned. It doesn't go to their mom. It's those four kids. That's it. Doesn't go to the other brother? No. No, it's just those four. Or the other other brother? As far as I know, it's just those four. Well, because they're the focus. They have to be the focus. You know, they're the older ones. They they see the world a specific way. Like Brant's perspective is interesting because he's crippled. Uh, John's is 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 interesting because he's a bastard. Uh, uh, Sansa and Arya are interesting because they don't have the same problems the other ones do, but they're women inside this world. So their perspective is also fascinating. But that's my point. Game of Thrones succeeded on making the focus those characters. Oh, I forgot there are chapters where it focuses on Daenerys. But still, like, it's a giant world and those books are massive, so it works a little differently. But each chapter <laughs> focuses on one of those characters. Yeah. So you only have to focus on that character for that chapter. And then the next chapter moves on to a different character. Each chapter reads like a fucking diary entry, kind of. But that's how the world's fleshed. I don't. I could. I could go on and on and on. But that's what makes the Last of Us so fucking special. Is it's Joel and Ellie's story. Technically, I would argue it's Ellie's story. But well, it is. You know. I fucking love this show. I love the game. I love the show. I love everything about it. I want more, 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 more. And we've only got two more episodes. <laughs> that's. And every episode has been fucking stellar. What grade would you give this episode? Uh, I'd give this an A+. Plus. Okay. <laughs> it was really, really well done. It was touching. It was heart-wrenching. Uh, it was light-hearted. It, it had everything in it. Uh, you know, the, the, the Ellie and Riley, they run the gamut of emotions. And, you know we see a lot of things uh, that play out in this short span of a few hours uh, that sets up so much and explains so much about Ellie's character. You know, do we see the episode end with her finding uh, going through drawers and cabinets looking for anything she can and she finds a needle and thread and she starts stitching up Joel's wound you know and that's how the episode closes out uh, but yeah it's really really well done I enjoyed it a lot what about you? A plus I mean was that that need to be said um, <laughs> uh, no it's 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 fucking perfect um I one of my concerns about this show, and and we've seen a little bit of it already, is um, you know people responding negatively to the the you know Ellie being gay, um, because we saw it with the Bill and Frank episode, um, but I wasn't sure how it was going to be perceived, and so I saw a little bit online of like, of course they got to go woke, but. That, that and I'm like the fuck dude. <laughs> the DLC is nine years old and it was established you just didn't in the want to pay attention because yeah I mean it was established in the DLC that but, she was gay nine years ago yeah hmm. like the fucking sequel I'm just gonna let you in on something oh I know I she's a like girlfriend her. Um, it's just, people just don't, they don't want to pay attention. And I think I even made a joke talking to a friend about it, like leave it to the internet to a, not pay attention and to think that somehow this wasn't a part of the games. Like when she Hulk came out, I saw a lot of people saying, Oh, this show sucks. It's gone woke or what the fuck ever. Meanwhile, Dan fucking Scott and uh, a couple other writers at Marvel and people Dan who've Slut. read the comics and you and I 
slot. Sorry. Um, we're just like, no, this is this is pretty accurate to the fucking comic. You just are dumb. Yeah. And uh, you know, I saw one guy, one tweeter who was like, this show's bad, yada yada yada. And somebody else was like, this is just like the comic. This is exactly like the comic. And they their response was, if that's the case, then the comic is probably also miserable. And it got me to this point where I was like, you cannot, you cannot watch an adaptation of something, say that it's bad because it's not like the source material without having actually read or experienced the source material. That's not how this fucking works. And then when it's pointed out that uh, it's just like the source material, and they say, well, that sucks too. But they were making the argument that it was too different from the source material at first. Ugh. People fucking suck, man. There's too many goddamn people on this planet, and I would be fine if a lot of them went away. Just away. I'm not being specific. Just away. You know, if, say, for some reason, certain people didn't have internet anymore. No ability to make their voices heard. That'd be great. <laughs> uh, anyway, there are two more episodes of the show. And I know exactly what's going to happen in the next two episodes. Uh, Me too. Have you watched the preview? No. Next episode? Next episode? No. In the preview, they show a certain building on fire. Nice. Yep. Also, just want to point this out. The voice of Joel in the video game, Troy Baker, plays is going to David's, be in one of the... He plays David's second in command, James. Yeah. I was like, you should remember James. I do. <laughs> I'm excited about this next episode. Oh, yeah. Me too. Very much me too. People are not ready. No. Not even a little bit. All right. Let's move on to Mandalorian. Speaking of Pedro Pascal and him being fucking awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Mandalorian Season 3, Chapter 17, uh, The Apostate, uh, was the first episode of this season. And it opens up. We see the armorer. Uh, she's crafting something. It turns out to be a helmet for a foundling. I'm going to assume a foundling because when we last saw the armorer, it was just her and Paz Vizsla were all that was left the original covert from season one. Uh, so there's been some time that has passed. We don't know how much, but the basically the armorer is rebuilding the covert and there are looks like a couple of dozen of mandalorians there you know including some some foundlings uh and they're performing a ceremony presenting the helmet to this young child who's taking the creed and then this giant monster just comes up out of the water and starts fucking the day up and it looked like a combination between an alligator and a snapping turtle. Uh, heavily armored back. But, yeah. It was pretty wild to see these Mandalorians just take up arms against this thing. You know, against all odds. And it looks like, you know, a couple of them get swallowed and chomped down on. And it looks like the armorer is getting ready to go the, that way. And then we see... Din Djarin come in with his fucking na souped up Naboo starfighter and just kills this beast. And then he and Grogu get out and they meet with the armorer and she's like, you removed your helmet. And he's like, yeah, but you told me there was a way to atone and I'm going to do that. I'm going to bathe in the living waters of Mandalore. She's like, the planet's destroyed. It's poison. There's no way. And he shows her an artifact from the surface. And he says, this looks like it may not be poisoned. So she 
uh, she agrees to uh, if he succeeds in bathing in the waters of Mandalore, she agrees to accept him back into the clan. So we see him and Grogu leave. They go to Navarro and meet with Grief Karga. We see Navarro has really sprouted up as a uh, hub for trade independently. Uh, they also address the absence of Cara Dune, which was, I thought was handled well. I thought that was handled well. It was like, yeah, after she turned in Moff Gideon, she was recruited by Special Forces. Now I need a new marshal. You want to be my marshal? He's like, I can. I got pressing matters to attend to. I need IG-11. He's like, that statue's just a few parts. And they try to resurrect IG-11, and he defaults to his assassination uh, programming. And... Uh, they manage to shut him down again, and they take him to these little droid uh, workers, which was awesome. Those mm-hmm. little creatures, what were they called? Anzillions? Anzillions, yeah. It's the same It's the same creature that uh, Babu Freak is. Babu from. Freak, yeah. Frick, that's right, Frick, my bad. Babu Frick. Oh, you're my oldest friend. Uh, <laughs> but Grogu hugging one of those things. No, squeezy, squeezy. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty funny. Yeah. There's an uh, impressive amount of fucking uh, uh, practical in this episode, too. Yeah, yeah. Uh, after we see that they tell them they can't repair the IG unit without a memory circuit, uh, he says, I'll go find a memory circuit. We see uh, an encounter with some pirates demanding that they, that Grief Karga, allow them to go drink in the former bar that their pirate lord had built and he's like that's my school now you want to drink come back to the office we can have a conversation there they refuse grief uh they have a duel grief cargo shoots the blaster out of the pirate vane's hand the others look like they're gonna try to gun down grief cargo and grief and mando uh gun all the others down leave vane alive and grief cargo says tell you uh what was the pirate's name? Oh, man. I I had it He's when I was looking at the credits. Yeah, he said, basically tell your boss that Navarro is no longer friendly to pirates and be gone. So when Mando's leaving to go search for a memory circuit, he gets ambushed by pirates before he can go to hyperspace. And he manages to take out five of them before Vane leads him back to the actual main pirate ship to which Mando outruns with his you know nitrous for lack of a better term uh, then it shows him land on another planet and he meets with Bo-Katan who we see has been abandoned by all of her forces and her fleet has been taken from her and her former loyal soldiers are working as mercenaries somewhere out in the galaxy. And she's like, you've got the dark saber. Just wave it around and they'll follow you. Uh, but my plans are done. She's like, Mandalore is dead. And uh, we see uh, we see him disagree. And he says, I'm going to Mandalore and I'll find out for myself. And she says goodbye. And that's how the episode ends. So it's more of a setup, kind of, you know, get you up to speed. This is what's been happening. Uh, This is where we are now. I don't know how much time has advanced, but it's obviously got to be months and months. Uh, Uh, According to what I read, it's it's right the fuck after uh, Book of Boba Fett. Yeah, but how much time did that take? You know, how much time has spanned between... Episode one of the Mandalorian okay. and episode. I, I, I do have an answer in that too. Um, uh, Deli Filoni said that uh, Grogu trained with Luke for about two years. Okay. So two years spanned. Yeah. That's what I was thinking. It was about two years. Well, see, that's the information that could be, that that would be very good. Well, I prefer, I'm going to be honest with you, I prefer a show kind of go the route of not telling us 
and us figuring it out and then like, kind of looking at it from that perspective. I think it's more fun because we have something to think about, but yeah, yeah. I mean, it's obvious that time had passed, but it was just unknown how much time had passed because right. that shit's not going to happen in the span of hours or days. That's going to take many, many months. Right. But yeah. yeah. Well, like fun, that port, fun, the port being built the way that it looked, and you're like, oh shit, time has really passed. Like, yeah, you see trees planted, you see fucking cobblestone walkways, and you know, everything is starting to look white and pristine instead of shabby and run down like it was. And yeah, it, it was really nice. Uh, a lot of stuff happened in this episode. We got some good action scenes, we got, you know, some good, uh, good exposition uh, you know i like that we got a new antagonist yeah yeah i'm sure he's going to be, be a secondary antagonist but we've got one yeah that's it's there's like i tell i think i told my dad i said this episode felt like it was a little bit of a recap oh that opening scene with the mandalorians and, and the foundling in the water mm-hmm. i thought that was a flashback oh you did oh yeah i immediately was like oh this is cool a little flashback to Dinjar and getting his helmet for the first time, and then he fucking flies in. I was like, "Oh, this is now." <laughs> see, see, Misty felt the exact same thing. She's like, "Oh, she's making him his helmet," and I was like, "That's not his helmet." Well, I thought maybe like it was, uh, it was uh, like his new, like the helmet he has now, like became or lost its paint or something to that effect. That's what I was thinking. <clears throat> but but yeah. um, episode was a lot of fun. What grade would you give it? Oh, it's an A plus. Like it's 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 a perfect setup for season three, as we have, in a sense, the end of what made season one and two so interesting. You know, we we have that finale, but there was a lot of loose ends that that need to be tied up going into this new season, like Moff Gideon and the dark saber and the Mandalorians and him being, you know, uh, you know, kind of what they introduced a little bit in in Book of Boba Fett, and it was like. There was so much stuff going into this that we needed a conclusion for. And the show's like, we're going to give you that. <laughs> Don't you worry. Don't you worry. Hell yeah. head. So I really, I really dug it and I'm looking forward to more. I, I wish the episode was a little bit longer. Like, yeah, it was only 37 minutes total yeah, was, from start to the end credits. Pretty short. So, but other than that, like no complaints, it's, it's fucking dude. I I'm not I'm not gay, but I might be for Pedro Pascal. <laughs> I might. So, you know what I'm saying? You know what I mean? You know what I mean by that? So, but yeah, I I I, I can't wait for more. It's gonna be super fun. So, uh, what about you? A plus, A plus. I thought it was really well done. Uh, a lot of fun, entertaining, beautiful, visually beautiful. Uh, funny when it needed to be, dramatic when it needed to be. Uh, just more of wonderful storytelling that we've been getting from this series. Uh, but yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, that's gonna do it for us, guys. Um, next week will be more of this. Just you know, the new episode of Poker Face, Mandalorian, and uh, Last of Us. Uh, we have two more episodes of both. Last of Us and Poker Face, so that's that's fun. And, you know, Mandalorian's going to continue. So in about two weeks' time, give or take, we'll have a new show to add or something to add. We're not just going to do Mandalorian, though we probably could. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so uh, keep that in mind. Keep watching those shows. If you haven't started uh, Poker Face, do it. It's fun. Sure, it's a week-to-week, so it's serialized, but, you know, because I usually don't like serialized shows, but this one, this one's this one's solid. This one's pretty fucking good. Yeah, uh, Maya still needs to watch uh, Knives Out and Glass Onion. But uh, yeah, I know. Well, I can't find any way for Knives Out. It should uh, be on Netflix. <clears throat> it's not. What? Did they it's take not. it off of Netflix? Yeah, it's not on there. I've been looking for the past month. The uh, I haven't fuck? found. It. I haven't found it anywhere without having to pay to watch it. I wow. figured give it give give it some time, it'll come back. Ah, that's incredible. Cause I know that it was on Netflix for a hot minute, because I that's how I got my folks to watch it. I dude, what the fuck? 
No, no. Oh, god damn it! That movie's so amazing. At least it is to me. Anyway, um, speaking of good movies, uh, I know we're not reviewing it, but Greg and I both watched Megan Unrated oh, on yeah. Peacock this weekend. Uh, highly recommend you check that out. It was a yeah. lot of fucking fun. If you're not into horror movies, don't worry. This is not scary at fucking all. I mean, there were some creepy moments here and there, but nothing scary. But it always felt like it was a creepy to set up like like it was kind of funny setup, if you will. Like I don't know. I don't know how to explain that. Like the moments that I think they meant to be creepy, I laughed at, but I think they were intending for that. Like I can usually yeah. tell if they're like, hey, we're trying to be silly or we're trying to be serious, but it didn't come off that way. Not here. It felt like everything was intentional. So if you laugh at it, that was intentional. Yeah. I don't know. It knew what it was and it wasn't trying to be anything extra. So I recommend it as well but um but yeah guys it's gonna do it for us we're gonna end this uh this episode uh make sure you follow us on all socials which are listed down below if we happen to add anything i doubt it because we've got three things to talk about so uh we'll try to let you guys know on social media i know that we're bad about it regardless but eh, you know how it is um check out the teespring store which is also listed down below uh you can get merch with our uh slogan and our cartoon faces on it which help produce the podcast as best it can be um boy i need to add more notes but like everything involving this podcast you'll find in the description notes down below um all that stuff is, is down there so go do that if you decide to buy something let us know we'll, we'll get a little retweet a follow a like a share you know all that jazz but um but yeah that's it for my notes my where can folks find you you can find me on Facebook under my name, Maya Dawn Fisher. It's a public profile. It's also linked to my Instagram and Twitter accounts. Your one-stop shop for everything that I'm up to. What about you, Greg? Where can people find you? Uh, you can find me at uh, under Chub Rock Geek under all socials. Um, as I've said before, that's called branding, baby. Uh, I haven't uploaded any funny clips onto Twitter for a while with... with uh, gaming with my friends but i need to get on that because i have like a bunch of fucking footage to go through um but yeah that's it guys that's it uh i got i got nothing else on my notes um but yeah again mandalorian poker face last of us three great shows that you, you should be watching um if you're not into star wars i guess i understand it but uh, it's good storytelling uh but yeah, guys, uh, thank you all for listening. We really appreciate you being here. Remember, fuck the GOP. Fuck the NRA. Donate and help where you can. And we'll see you next week. Take care, everybody.